Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, today, we're focusing on a really important topic, and that's uh, work zones. And specifically, our webinar today is going to be used to explore strategies that transportation agencies and those working in the field, advocates, can use to uh, protect vulnerable road users in work zones. How do we maintain access and connections for pedestrians and people of all abilities? And how can we ensure connectivity for bicyclists traveling through work zones? We've assembled an excellent panel today, and we look forward to uh, their presentations and following those up with a bit of discussion on this topic to hear their perspectives. Uh, this webinar we're doing today is supported by the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Safety through a program led by VHB and the UNC Highway Safety Research Center that provides training and technical assistance to the FHWA-designated pedestrian and bicyclist focus cities and states. Uh, my name is Dan Jolene, and I'm going to be acting as the host and facilitator for today's webinar. What I'd like to do now is introduce you to each of the panelists that we have joining us today. Uh, we've got a couple of folks here to share the FHWA perspective from the Federal Highway Administration. So we have Patrick Gomez uh, here, who has served as a civil rights specialist for FHWA's Resource Center since 2010, uh, where he performs work in various civil rights areas. Um, but his primary focus is disability law. Uh, he's given hundreds of ADA and other civil rights presentations in person and via webinar video conference throughout the U.S. to thousands of public and private employees. We're really excited to have Patrick here with us. Um, Martha Kapit Kapitanoff, I almost got that right, Martha, I'm sorry, is a transportation specialist on FHWA headquarters work zone management team. And she's worked for FHWA for over 20 years. And her, in her current capacity, she provides leadership and guidance to the development and implementation of effective work zone management practices and innovations on a national level. Martha is the FHW lead for the Commercial Motor Vehicle Safety and Work Zones Initiative. We're also joined by Melissa Anderson, uh, who is a, a professional engineer specializing in transportation access and pedestrian safety. She's worked in and with public agencies for over 25 years, including work with the U.S. Access Board on the development of the proposed Public Right-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines, or PROAG. She's currently the principal of a company providing accessibility oversight and training across the country. Um, we're finally joined by uh, Matthew Marcoux, uh, who is the Associate Director for the Public Space Regulations Division at the Washington, D.C. Department of Transportation, or DDOT. Mr. Marcoux oversaw the implementation of several enhancements and programs that have improved the efficiency of the public space permitting and inspections processes, uh, and we'll share uh, Washington, D.C.'s perspective on this important topic today uh, to round out our presentation. I'm really grateful uh, to have all of these panelists here with us today, and I don't want to take too much time away from their presentations, but I do want to share with you all as attendees some of the things you can expect from the webinar, some housekeeping items. Um, you won't have the ability today to uh, join over the phone and speak on the webinar, though you do have the ability to submit comments and questions to me uh, using the questions pod in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, take a look at that and send in those comments whenever you have them and those questions. I'll be using those to pull from to, to generate the discussion period we have later in the webinar. Uh, if I can't get to them right away, I will try to reserve some time for them during that final 20, 25 minutes. If you have any issues technically with the webinar today, if your uh, computer freezes up or if you lose audio, the best strategy for that is to close out of the webinar and join back in. You should be able uh, to, to come right back with us, and that can usually uh, take care of some of those problems. We are um, going to be hosting a, uh, an archive page for this webinar today. Um, so uh, at pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars, uh, you'll be able to find uh, a copy of the presentation today uh, that we've already posted, and I'll send out the link to that shortly. Um, within a couple of days, we will be posting a video recording of the webinar. So if there's anything you miss, if you have to duck out for a bit, or if you want to share it with a colleague, you will be able to find the recording that will be available to you, along with links to any other resources um, on, uh, on the topic that we are be able to, we'll be able to post on that uh, webinar page. So take a look uh, at that webinar archive page if you have time. I am also going to email it to you later today. So you'll get a follow-up email after the webinar is over with that archive information as well as a page that you can use to generate a certificate of attendance for this webinar. Um, and it's important to know that if you have multiple people attending the webinar from your site, please share that follow-up email with them so that they can all generate their own certificates of attendance. But those will show that you've completed 1.5 hours of instruction. Hopefully, you can use those to self-report your continuing education requirements. Um, for the planners out there and used to uh, claiming planning credits, CMs, 
We did get the webinar approved for 1.5 CM credits. So if you go to the AICP event calendar, you'll be able to find this event there and log your, uh, log your credits as you usually do. If you want to keep track of what PBIC has going on, um, you can do that in a number of ways. We do have our webinar page where we'll be posting information about upcoming sessions. We're on social media at the handles you see on the screen, uh, Pedbike Info on Facebook and on Twitter. And then finally, you can keep track of us through our, uh, our mailing list. We send out quarterly updates as well as information about our upcoming webinars. All really good ways to um, keep track of what we have uh, going on. I'm going to take a quick poll of the audience before we get into our presentation. The purpose of this poll is really to help us figure out about how many people are out there today. Um, we'd like to ask you um, to, um, oh, excuse me. Let me see if I can't get that poll um, working. Okay, it should be up now. Uh, we'd like to ask you, um, no, I can't get it going. Well, that's all right. We'll just skip the poll for today. Um, there's something going on with that. I'm going to instead of the poll, uh, move right into our first presentation, which is going to be Patrick Gomez from FHWA. Um, Patrick, keep an eye out on your screen. I'm going to uh, send it over to you, and I'll let you know when we see um, uh, your slides, and you can get going. All right, Patrick, uh, you're all set. Great. Well, uh, good morning and, and afternoon, uh, everybody. And once again, my name is Patrick Gomez, I, and I work for the FHWA Resource Center in uh, Colorado. And I'm going to, to very generally set the stage for work zone compliance by, by talking about the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines, or PROWAG, as well as the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or MUTCD. And as a heads up, other presenters will also be touching on the PROAG and MUTCD. So they'll probably um, carry on from what I'm saying and add to it throughout the, the various presentations. And when I'm done, I'm going to then turn the class over to my colleague, uh, Martha Kapitanov, and she'll highlight some resources for work zones. So let me go to some of the slides here. So I just want you to... to to remember that pedestrian routes and features include sidewalks and shared use paths, crosswalks, pedestrian signals, and access to transit stops and shelters and so on. And I really want you to remember how important access to transit is for all pedestrians, but especially for individuals with disabilities who many times rely on transit to, to get to work, to school, to shopping, and entertainment, and without transit, many people are stuck and cannot actively participate in daily activities. So these features must be included in an alternate pedestrian uh, uh, pedestrian route. And we'd like to see the alternate route be located on the same side of the uh, same side of the roadway as the closed route, as individuals with disabilities are familiar with certain streets and their landmarks. And we, we would like to keep things familiar for them. These are the locations where we're seeing the, the most complaints and lawsuits, as they're the areas where pedestrians are traversing on a daily basis and affect them the most. Plus, citizens and advocates know their rights and are filing complaints and lawsuits at higher rates than ever before. So before I go into the next few slides, please understand that states and local public agencies have discretion regarding the standards that they're using in the pedestrian environment. In the following slides, I'm going to be talking about the 2009 MUTCD and the PROAG. And now I really want to be clear about standards in the public right of way and the, and the PROAG, as this is an oft-asked question around the country. The PROAG is currently not an approved standard per se by the United States Department of Transportation and the United States Department of Justice. However, it was created by the United States Access Board specifically for the pedestrian environment. <clears throat> so you can choose to use the PROAG in your pedestrian environment. And it is a good practice to follow, but certainly not the only choice and certainly not a mandate. There are also some states that follow the 2010 standards for ADAG for their pedestrian environment, but the issue with using the 2010 standards 
is that it's a building standard that is silent in some instances in the pedestrian environment. So states and local public agencies that follow the 2010 standards in the pedestrian environment have to account for those silent areas with something else. So in these supplementing instances, states may supplement using the, the pro ag or with something else. So in a nutshell, you have the ability to choose the standard that you follow in the pedestrian environment, but once this is established, it should be used reasonably and consistently. And I would say re regardless of whether it's in an urban, suburban, or rural area of the state. I referenced the, the pro ag a few times in the following slides because stemming from my numerous training sessions around the United States, many states and local public agencies have, of their own volition, adopted the pro ag even though it has not been officially adopted by USDOT and um, USDOJ and in anticipation of its eventual adoption that we hope will uh, will happen relatively soon. But we cannot give you a current time frame for the official adoption by uh, DOT and DOJ due to a variety of factors, but, but it's currently not on the access board's agenda for a vote, but we remain cautiously optimistic. So when you freely choose to adopt the PROAG as your standard, Again, even though it's not an official standard, it becomes your standard and reasonable and consistent process and would be looked to for reference if there is a complaint or a lawsuit. Now, please remember that construction in, in the public right of way can be particularly hazardous to pedestrians with visual or mobility impairment. Using caution tape and traffic cones and sidewalk clones, closed signs alone is not acceptable and unfortunately this is many times the norm has become the norm rather than the exception for a lot of work zones and i'm seeing this in in many states throughout the united states a lot of times they put up cones they put up tape and they think that they're protecting people around it making the assumption that people can see the cones and the tape um, consistent with the with the ada title ii requirements to maintain features of facilities in order to provide ready access to individuals with disabilities, the PROAG R205 requires that alternate pedestrian access routes be provided to the maximum extent feasible when an existing pedestrian access route is blocked by construction, alteration, maintenance, or other temporary condition. And R205's advisory goes on to say that section 6G Zero, um, zero 05 of the MUTCD recommends that whenever possible, work should be done in a manner that does not create a need to detour pedestrians from existing pedestrian routes. Extra distance and additional pedestrian street crossings add complexity to a trip and increase exposure to risk uh, of risk to accidents. Um, the temporary route must be detectable and include accessibility features such as curb ramps. The affected route must provide a warning, alerting pedestrians to the construction and alternate route. Cones and, again, cones and construction tapes are not adequate to warn persons with visual disabilities of the route closure and path guidance to temporary route. Rather, a continuous detectable edging should be provided throughout the length of the project one example would be a, a chain link fence with a continuous bottom rail, which be, would be detectable by an individual using a white cane, and they can use that as a shoreline when they're, when they're using their white cane. Also, chapter six on the manual of, on uniform traffic control devices provides useful information on temporary traffic control, including maintaining accessibility, and includes various examples of detectable edging. So stemming from your ability, as I said from the, in, in the very beginning, to choose the standard in the pedestrian environment, in this next slide, I simply would like to reference R302 from the 2005 PROAG. It contains some good language regarding alternate pedestrian access routes, but remembering that it was drafted before the 2009 MUTCD. So alternate pedestrian access routes shall comply with R302 of the 2005 PROAG, which states that alternate paths must be provided on the same side of the street uh, as the disrupted route, again, to the maximum extent feasible, and where it's exposed to adjacent construction, traffic, 
or other hazards, the path shall be protected by a pedestrian barricade or channelization device that is continuous, stable, non-flexible, and consists with, consist, be consistent with the features described in chapter 6F of the MUTCD. And it goes on to talk about the types of barricades and where it's located, whether you're actually in the street or you're on the sidewalk, the different types of barricades and channelization devices that you can use. Um, and one particular thing that needs to be pointed um, to is that pedestrians need advance notice of sidewalk closures so that they don't have to, to backtrack. And, and, and the example I've used is somebody with, with low vision or who is blind, instead of putting a closure or a warning sign um, right at the, at the site, you might want to put it at the end of the block so the person doesn't have to walk all the way into a construction site find that it's closed and turn around and go back to the end of the block. And the alternate route needs to be at least as accessible as the original route. So where it's exposed to adjacent construction, traffic, or other hazards, the path shall be protected by a pedestrian barricade or channelization device that is continuous, stable, non-flexible, and, consist and, and consists of the features described in 6F of the MUTCD. And an example would be uh, a top and bottom rail, 32 inches high and continuous within two inches of the ground. So you have two different rails, one that usually they'll be running their hand um, across and one bottom rail so that their white cane will be able to use it as a shoreline. And lastly, uh, the 2005 PROAG language R302 is the same language found in the MUTCD and the MUTCD contains a lot of good guidance regarding alternate pedestrian access routes and is incorporated by reference uh, from R205 of the 2011 PROAG. The MUTCD Part 6 guidance goes on to state that the alternate pedestrian access route should provide access to temporary transit stops. Work zone uh, communication should be audible and or detectable. The geometry and alignment of the facility should meet ADA requirements, providing a smooth, continuous, hard surface with no curb or abrupt changes in greater terrain, uh, or, or terrain. So essentially the same elements as an accessible and compliant sidewalk. And of note, reference to the provision of alternate route on the same side of the street isn't found in the MUTCD, but is found in the 2005 PROAG. So basically, you should be really looking to the MUTCD, which is incorporating uh, the, the PROAG. And the one last thing I want to say before I hand it over to Martha is when it's talking about audible or, and or detectable, I think that's very important. Again, for individuals who are blind or who have low vision, many times we're just putting up signs and they can't see the signs, they can't read the signs, and therefore they cannot pr proceed with what the sign says. So if you have a, 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 an audible sign, which there are many um, audible signs out there that are ADA accessible, you get to program the sign and you get to put in whatever language is necessary under the circumstances. If there's a detour, if there's a diversion, they'll, you, can, you, can, you can put the information on that and it wouldn't constantly be going off. It would have a motion detector that is tripped by somebody walking by and that would help tremendously with, with people who are with low vision and who are blind. So, so with that very short introduction, I'm going to turn the program over to Martha Capitano. Martha? Thank you, I'll Patrick. Ahead, and I'll go ahead, Martha, and uh, send you the screen and let you know when it's, when it's up and available. So you should see it now, Martha. Okay. Perfect, you're all set. Okay, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. My name is Marissa Capitano. I work for Federal Highway Administration the, under the Work Zone Management Team. Today, I'm going to share with you some information that we have been developing or some materials that we have been developing under the Federal Highway Work Zone Safety Grant Program and some rules and regulations that um, if you receive, especially if you receive federal funding, that you need to obey. But before I do that, uh, I would like to share with you some work zone data. The 2018 data 
is available, but we are in our office still analyzing and reviewing it. Therefore, I have not been able to update this table, but uh, it is my understanding that these are the states or some of the cities are in this state for the federal highway focus uh, state for pedestrians. So I wanted to share this with you just to give you an idea of where your state stands in regards to fatal crashes, fatalities, and uh, fatalities involving pedestrians as well as fatal, uh, fatal crashes. So just to give you uh, an idea, even though I'm sharing the 2017 data, at a national level, we had 799 fatalities out of those 126. So that's close to 16%. And when we look at the data from last, the 2016 data, there were 112 pedestrian fatalities out of 781 fatalities. So that was about 14%. So the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because, again, comparing just 2016 and 2017 data, we have seen an increase of about 2%. Uh, again, these are some of the key work zone regulations, so work zone safety and mobility final rule, temporary traffic control devices, you heard uh, Patrick share with you about, a little bit about the manual you know, from traffic control devices. The crash worthiness is important as well, but that's not something that we're going to uh, cover today. But I just want you to be aware of these regulations. Now, uh, in regards to the MUPCD, when you are working on developing a temporary traffic control plan, most of your information will be on part six for both pedestrians. Uh, you also look into some information for detours for bicyclists in the case it's needed. We recommend not to as the extent possible, not to have detours. But if you have to have a detour for bicyclists or pedestrians, as you are planning on the project, so don't think about this when you're already in construction, we want you to start thinking about this and the minute that you know that this project is gonna happen. So that's when the works on safety and mobility and final rule comes into place. Basically, we're telling the state that as soon as you start thinking about a work on project, that you start thinking about everything else that will happen in that place. Think about your specifications, your standards, the contract document, anything that is on that contract will help you reinforce these signs or policies in any of your projects. Again, uh, going back to the METCD and, and the compliance, if you are going to have a detour and you're designing it, think about how far, if if you were the pedestrian or the bicyclist, how would you feel about driving or being walking around that? Uh, is it too long, too far away? Because you know that as pedestrians or humans, we want to continue the same route that we do on a daily basis. So those are things that you have to consider and think about. I'm not saying that you cannot have detours, but just think about what other possibilities you could do to avoid a detour. If you have a detour or and you are accommodating pedestrians and bicyclists, especially pedestrians. You heard Patrick talking about accommodating um, using the PROAG and if it becomes the standard for your state, then it's the standard that you will follow for your projects. Again, if you want this to be implemented and for your contractors to uh, obey to that, you have to have it in your contract. As part of that, you also want to have partnership, build partnership, communicate. We, we have this public of information and outreach element uh, on the project. Use your media, new releases, websites on, uh, for the project or your DOT. You need to communicate out as much as you can when are you impacting the pedestrians because you have to build a convenient and accessible temporary pathway for pedestrians. When you see these are examples of signings, uh, signs that you should follow. Again, the, the idea is that if you need to have a detour or you are building an accessible pathway, make sure you separate your construction site from your bikes and pet as much as you can. The main idea is to protect and communicate. Always try to remember this and make sure you train your staff as well. Now, I know I share a lot of information, but 
in regards to this effort under the work zone safety program or, or grant program, we have developed, we have partnerships in this particular cases with the University of Wisconsin and Madison. So when you're looking for ideas or tools that are available to help your designer, again, to start thinking about this as they are working on designing the temporary traffic control plan for your infrastructure, these are some tools. They are available online on the National Work Zone Safety Information Clearinghouse website. It helps the designer have a better understanding on how to accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists. This is just an example of the things that they cover. The problem is we used to have a bus stop and now through the project, and again, this is just an example, uh, what do we do? We cannot just remove it. Well, let's build a temporary accessible uh, bus stop. So again, things like these, sometimes we don't think about it, but perhaps as you share this information with your designers, whether they're in-house or your contractors or consultants, I'm sorry, they could be thinking about this thing before the project actually happens. So you try to avoid um, work orders and adding costs to your project. With, again, under the Work Zone Safety Grant Program, we have a partnership with the American Road and Transportation Builders Association in conjunction with the Texas Transportation Institute. They built a field guide. So this is more tailored to field workers. Uh, Copies are available online, and you can download it and print as many as you want, or you can reach out at the worksonesafety.org and they can send you copies of it. Things that this guide will share is something like what to, to do. If you're a worker and you're working with some uh, wood panels, uh, what should we just dump them there on the sidewalk? No, just have to think about clearing the sidewalks and the pathways and accommodating pedestrians as much as you can. In some situations where you could not, for whatever reasons, right away or uh, it's just a half an hour that I'm blocking this sidewalk, but another idea will be for the contractor to have a worker, a flagger, somebody that can help guide people as they are trying to go from point A to point B around the construction site. Another uh, good tools or, or training that we have, we have the American uh, Traffic Safety Service Association. They have developed a training and it's provided free of charge uh, for state BOTs. Contractors will have to pay about, I believe it's $25. But this is a two-day training course that is available for this one in particular is for designers. And there is a one day, the other one was a two day, this one is also by ATSA, and it's a one day. The other one was more in the urban setting with portions of this, the one day, uh, designing temperature control zones for pedestrian accessibility. So it does have uh, an urban setting and how to accommodate pedestrians. This one is more accommodating pedestrians, the one day, uh, short version. ATSA has also developed a checklist that is available in Spanish and English, and they have developed a guide. Uh, this guide is only available in English, but it's a very good tool as you are working and setting up your pedestrian pathways just to make sure that I consider this, that I think about this, that I communicate. So it's a very good checklist. Again, it's uh, available on the Work Zone Safety Information Clearinghouse website. All these uh, resources that I have shared are available on the National Work Zone Safety Information Clearinghouse. We also have the Federal Highway Work Zone Management website with a lot of other tools. I wanted to point out that Federal Highway, for those of you that may not be familiar with this, we have a Federal Aid Essentials for local public agencies. So there are a lot of mini videos with a lot of very good information for local agencies. Uh, under the National Works on Safety Information Clearinghouse, yes, there's a lot of information, uh, not only on crash data for your state, uh, unfortunately not necessarily by cities, but yes, by states and on a national level. We also have a web page dedicated to pedestrians and work zones. So you could find all the information that we have 
Georgetown uh, and states have shared with us, just to give an example, if you're looking for other states that have very good uh, guidance, the Virginia Department of Transportation in 2016 developed a pedestrian and bicycle guidance, and that is available there as well. You have states like Washington State. So again, feel free to spend some time on that webpage. And then last but not least, the American Traffic Safety Service Association, they provide those trainings and they have that training material that I mentioned earlier. And with that, I will uh, let Melissa share with you a lot of good information that she has in regards to accommodating pedestrians and work zone. Thank you so much, Martha, um, for, for that presentation. I'm gonna take a moment before we get into Melissa's presentation to um, to launch that poll that I that I tried to do earlier and, and didn't have a chance to. So let's let's try this again. What we wanted to find out from you all is about how many people are out there today. So this will only take a few seconds and then we'll move right on with our presentation. But really, we're going for, uh, is it just you out there? Do you have a small group with you? Two to three, four to five, six, seven or eight or more? Um, uh, pick the right option for you and then we'll uh, go ahead and move right along uh, into uh, Melissa Anderson's presentation. <clears throat> Maybe about five more seconds on the poll and then I'll close it and we'll move right along. Thank you all very much. I'm going to close the poll now. I appreciate you all taking time to respond to that. Um, let's shift gears a bit and um, and talk with uh, Melissa Anderson um, about uh, some some specific uh, considerations for work zones. Um, Melissa, I sent the screen over to you. Uh, you should be able to take a look at that. And all right, now I've got your slides and and you're all set to go, Melissa. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Melissa Anderson, and I want to talk to you a little bit of, from the aspect of people from users who may have disabilities. So we're going to talk about work zone access for pedestrians with disabilities. And okay, so transportation access is a civil right, and one of the things that really spurred the acceptance of the Americans with Disabilities Act were people in wheelchairs who couldn't use buses. And they staged several protests and they said, you know, everybody has a right to transportation access. Um, so any program or service that's provided by a Title II agency, which is a government agency, should be accessible to and usable by people with disabilities. And that's what the ADA is all about. And there are a lot of resources available for developing your accessible work zones. Martha provided a whole bunch of them, and I actually went back through some of the, her presentation links and reviewed some of those resources. So when you're looking for things, um, go out and search for them. There's a lot of good information out there, and there's a lot of information that people are, have shared in, you know, across the country. But we're gonna be looking primarily at the manual and uniform traffic control devices. Um, 2010 ADA standards, which apply to buildings and sites, but they also apply to curb ramps based on the ADA regulations. And like Patrick said, the proposed public right-of-way accessibility guidelines is not an adopted standard, but it is, you're required to make your facilities accessible even without a standard. And it is a good resource to use as you develop your, your practices and your policies um, in making things accessible. So it does require that you provide a pedestrian access route when you disrupt your, your regular pedestrian access route. It refers to specific sections of the manual and uniform traffic control devices. And Patrick talked quite a bit about those. So when we provide a pedestrian access route, whether it's your standard route that's always there or whether it's the alternate route that you provide during a construction project, um, the requirements are the same for an alternate route and your regular route. So you're looking at your surface has to be firm, stable, and slip resistant. You have to have a continuous clear width. 48 inches is the minimum, but sometimes these are confined spaces. So having your 60 inch passing space is important. Um, watching your running slope that it doesn't exceed street grade, or if you're crossing the street that you're not more than 5%. Uh, Cross slope, 2% maximum. Um, there are some exceptions. Vertical alignment, and this is this is important in work zone areas where you're providing materials to cross or um, 
to overlay some of your construction area. Quarter inch vertical is the maximum that's allowed a half inch bevel when you change surfaces. Uh, openings are half an inch maximum in the direction of travel, so you don't want any gaps that a person could um, trap their cane or a wheelchair wheel could get, get trapped in. Protruding objects, four inches maximum between 27 and 80 inches anywhere along the circulation path. And curb ramps um, have a lot of requirements, but you know your regular 8.3% grade, 2% cross slope. The ADA standards allow three feet wide, four foot wide is in pro ag and is much more accommodating in an external environment. And if you have elevation changes along your path of travel, you may be looking at a regular ramp. And if you have an elevation change more than six inches, you may have to add edge protection and handrails. So why does all this matter? There are a lot of people who have disabilities. In the United States, about 61 million adults live with a disability. And this information comes from the Centers for Disease Control. So that's about 26% of the adults in the United States. That's a lot of us. So it's not, it's not a minor issue that you can, you can think that this doesn't matter in your projects. So what types of disabilities do we have? We have a lot of people with mobility issues, 13.7%. Um, and cognition, which is when we don't think about as people physically move through a work zone, but it's important also. Um, hearing impairments at almost 6% and vision impairments at 4.6%. The independent living and self-care are ones that we don't really address specifically in our accessibility guidelines, at least in public right away. So when we look at mobility disabilities, it means that a person could have trouble walking or climbing stairs. And you may see them using wheelchairs or walkers, canes or crutches. They may just have a shuffling gait. And it could just be that they're easily fatigued from an illness or medications. Um, when you look at the pictures here, you can see this is from a project site I was on. I was watching this older gentleman because I knew he was going to be crossing the street. And some people just walk really, really slow. And it's you know, it's a struggle for them to get across the street. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see there are only three seconds left on the the walk time or in the clear zone, clear time, and he's made it less than halfway across. So we have to take special special care for the um, people with disabilities in our work. So some of the common problems we see are having a continuous route that has a clear width. Um, so on the left-hand side, work zone, they've provided, they've provided a mid-block crossing, but it starts in a driveway, which isn't ideal, even if the slope works, you don't want pedestrian sharing space with vehicles any more than you have to. But when you get across the street on the other side near the sign, there's a vertical curb. So this crosswalk is for everybody as long as they can step up on a curb. That is, I mean, that's what discrimination is all about, is excluding people who have the dis a disability of some kind. Picture on the right is all too common. Um, even if it's not part of the pedestrian, the alternate pedestrian access route, a lot of times when road work is done, they just throw signs wherever they, wherever they can. And a lot of times they end up either protruding over the sidewalk where a person with vision impairment won't see them and could walk into them, or they just completely block the sidewalk altogether. Another common problem is surfaces and level changes. So it's important that a surface is firm, stable, and slip resistant. So materials like steel plates um, are slippery when they're wet, and plywood is not necessarily uh, very stable in an outdoor environment. Uh, I did, when I was looking through some of some of Martha's resources, I believe the one from Texas has a lot of good information on different materials that can be used to provide surface treatments. And you can also see how well their barriers are holding up in that left-hand picture. Something else to think about when you provide a way to get over an area is how are you treating those edges? 
you're allowed to have a quarter inch vertical change in height along your path. And if, if you have up to half an inch, you can bevel it. Any more than that, you really need to treat like a grade change and, and put it either at 5% or less or provide a ramp. And so elevation changes, aside from just having the, the surface level discontinuities, uh, may require curb ramps or ramps. And you can see in the top left-hand picture, they've provided a temporary route and a small asphalt wedge to get from the sidewalk down to the level of a, a pedestrian alternate route that is in the, that street level. Um, there are a lot of devices out there that can be built by the contractors, they can be purchased by contractors, um, but it's important that you make, make your alternate routes accessible to people with mobility challenges. And like I said, if you have an elevation change in the longitudinal path that you're going and you're greater than street grade, um, greater than 5%, you may be looking at needing to provide an actual ramp. And then you need to go back to the ramp standards in the PROAG, which are basically the same as the ones in the 2010 standard. And if you're more than six inches, it includes edge protection and handrails. So what about people with cognitive disabilities? A person with cognitive disability may have trouble evaluating a situation. Um, they, may, they may need very, very clear input on what's going on, what do you expect me to do? And sometimes they have a hard time concentrating or remembering decisions or they just become very anxious. And sometimes they have to have information provided more than once. And things to consider for people who have cognitive disabilities is that you have clear wayfinding. So if you look at the picture on the left, if a person who is anxious or doesn't get messages very clearly reaches a point on the sidewalk where this is what they see, it may not be clear to them what they're supposed to do. Again, and on the right-hand side, you see a sidewalk that just ends in a pile of dirt with a bunch of barrels in it. Um, unfortunately, this is actually a situation I encountered in my own neighborhood recently. And if, if you're trying to do the right thing, if it's a busy road, you don't want to get into traffic, it's not clear what a pedestrian is expected to do in this, in this situation. And also use very simple messaging. Tell me what you want me to do and make it very simple so I can understand it. And providing signs, um, icons. So in your alternate routes around a construction zone is not the time to have a complicated push button message that is basically a user guide. So provide simple things simple icons. Um, it helps for people who, who may not have the cognitive ability to understand complicated messages, but also helps for children and maybe people who don't speak English. Hearing disability. About 6% of our, of our population is either deaf or has really serious difficulty in hearing. Um, they may use sign language or read lips. And we don't think about people with hearing disabilities in the right away from an accessibility standpoint very often. But in construction, uh, there aren't really any significant accommodations that need to be made. But you probably, as a contractor, the contractors need to be aware that someone who is moving along and you depend on them to hear the beeping of a truck in reverse, they may not hear them. Um, also, they depend on a lot of, of visual information, visual input to make their decisions and know what to do. And, you know, there's a lot more clutter in the visual environment in the construction area. And sometimes we end up hiding our, our pedestrian walk signals behind uh, construction signs or scaffolding. So it, that becomes a disadvantage for everybody, too if they can't hear an accessible pedestrian signal. So people with vision impairments. This is, this is a complicated thing to solve. Um, a person with visual impairment may be blind or they may just not see very well. And they might use a white cane. They may have a guide dog with them. 
or they may have nothing. They may be trying to travel independently and just not see very well. And so that's about 5% of our population. There are a lot of different kinds of vision loss. So it's really hard to pinpoint specific solutions that solve all the problems. And here are some examples that um, you may have seen before. I borrowed them from Janet Barlow at Accessible Design for the Blind. But the upper left picture shows you, you know, what a, what a person with normal 2020 vision is likely to see in the street. Um, top right hand side, the top right hand side is somebody with low visual acuity. So things may just be a little bit blurry. The bottom left is um, somebody who, who doesn't see their central vision. So it might be a person who has macular degeneration. And you can imagine that walking around with, with this type of view means that you need, you need additional cues. The bottom right hand side um, could be someone who has glaucoma or something like that. And again, it's, if you think about a person traveling with this type of vision, their information that they're perceiving can be pretty limited. So common problems for people with vision loss, obviously, is wayfinding. Um, how do we get around? So how do you get around on a normal basis? You get used to your environment. You get used to the sounds and hearing things. And then when we disrupt them with construction and have to detour people, like Patrick said, trying to keep people on the same side of the road, traveling in their regular path that they're used to traveling is always, always the goal. But sometimes you can't do that and you have to detour people maybe across the street. And we have the same picture again on the, the upper left. Imagine if you were a blind pedestrian, you got this far down the sidewalk. Obviously you can't continue straight, but if you turn to the left where you're expected to go, where do you go? There's no real information on what the expectations are. You'll either run into a light pole, run into the barrels, or if you get past those, you may run into a car and another barrel. Um, we need to be looking at, at positive guidance information for all pedestrians, but especially for those with vision loss. So the upper right-hand picture is, is a motion-censored audible messaging device. Um, Patrick talked about that. And again, it's it's really important that we provide simple messaging. You know, and it could be as simple as sidewalk closed, cross the street to the left, turn right, go down a block, turn right and cross the street again, and continue on your path, or something something with similar, very simple messaging. And the barricades that are required based on the MUTCD, there's an example in the bottom picture. They're bright, so they have a lot of contrast. They're easy for people with low vision to see. For people who are blind, um, they provide a continual top surface at the right height, so you can trail a hand along them. Um, they provide drainage at the bottom, but they, they're still low enough that they're detectable with a cane. And yellow tape. Patrick mentioned yellow tape. I hate yellow tape. There's a purpose for it but it's not to protect pedestrians in a construction area. Um, so there are proper barrier requirements and people with vision impairments, they depend on us as engineers to make sure we put devices out that keep them safe. And another major one are protruding objects. So a protruding object um, is, applies to anywhere a person can walk. So anywhere within the circulation path, not just in your pedestrian access route, that may just be a portion of the sidewalk that you have available. So anything that protrudes more than four inches in a height between 27 and 80 inches, where somebody may walk into it without first detecting it with a cane or where a dog guide or a guide dog is likely to walk around it. So how can we how can we make this work on our projects? And here are some ideas that, um, and there are a lot of ideas, but here are just some really basic, simple things that, as a public agency, how how can we make this happen on our projects? So in the design phase, 
it's really important that you look at the project and look at it from the aspect of somebody who may have a disability, um, especially those with visual vision impairments. You know, how is a person going to get through the project? And you have to have you have to have a pedestrian traffic control plan. Um, anytime you disrupt that that pedestrian access route, what are you going to do? And you can develop policies. There is some. I saw that we had a lot of questions come in ahead of time about, you know, is there a certain volume of pedestrians where it doesn't matter? And the answer to that is no. There are some guidelines that are based on time. How long are you going to have that that path disrupted? And the ADA allows a disruption in service um, for maintenance. So if an elevator's down, it's down. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to fix it. So you can be down for a short time, but I can't tell you what that time is. It's kind of relative to your project. But there's also a requirement to maintain accessible features. So if you have a sidewalk, you have to maintain it. You have to keep people moving through your, through your area. A very important way to provide good access on your projects is having, having a having a complete pre-construction meeting that really emphasizes accessibility. Let your contractors know accessibility is priority. It's important. You're, you're serious about um, making them follow what you have in your construction plans, what you have in your temporary control plan, traffic control plans. You need to talk about what the access requirements are and what your traffic control plan is trying to accomplish. Review the equipment that they're planning on using. Does it meet the MUTCD requirements? What are the material requirements? And during construction, you're required to put out public notices for a lot of projects. Make sure that you include the traffic impacts to pedestrians. So if you're closing a sidewalk, uh, when you put your public notice out, you might say Main Street will be closed or the right lane is going to be closed from this date to this date. You can also say that pedestrians will be de detoured to the other side of the street from this date to this date. So that pre-notification is really beneficial. And um, get out there and make sure that your contracts review their alternate routes, at least on a daily basis. You know, anytime they're moved, um, anytime there's any kind of disruption, walk through it. Walk through it thinking about how is a person who is using a wheelchair or a walker, someone who doesn't see, how are they going to get through your site? If you follow the directions, and I, I sometimes find following detours to be, to be a fun source of entertainment. I ended up in the bottom of a building under construction one time just by following pedestrian detour signs. Um, so make sure that, that it works, that you're doing something that that users can actually use to get through your facilities and employee training and contractor training. If you have training to have, and you have someone come in and talk to you about this, um, invite your contractors to the trainings. Have an interactive discussion between your agency employees and your inspectors and your contractors about what works, what doesn't work, what your expectations are, and get your citizen advisory groups involved. Um, so but all those things are, are ways that you can make, make this actually happen. And there are a lot of lawsuits that involve work zones, and they go as far as the federal level. And I think it's important that we remember that filing, a, filing an accessibility complaint on the civil rights page for the Department of Justice is easier than ordering your Christmas presents on Amazon. You don't even have to have your credit card. So this is important, and when people with disabilities can't get through um, and can't use the transportation system they need to, they do have that right to file a complaint. So thank you very much. I hope that you found this helpful, and I'll turn this back over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Melissa. That was wonderful, and um, I'm going to turn things over to our final presentation now uh, to hear a presentation from uh, Matthew Marcoux uh, in the perspective uh, of how this is being done in Washington, D.C., um, and then we'll wrap up with some discussion. So, Matthew, I've got your slides up. Uh, you're all set to go. 
Great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. And um, I think all the information we've received from the other um, uh, presenters has been a great um, explanation of what we're all expected to do. And what I want to discuss is how this is being implemented in the District of Columbia. Um, my name is Matthew Marcoux. I'm the Associate Director of the Public Space Regulation Division of the District Department of Transportation. And uh, our office's responsibility is to manage um, private users of the right-of-way. So that's utilities, developers, contractors, et cetera, as they're doing their work. So we review their civil engineering plans, their electrical engineering plans, but we also review their traffic control plans. What I'm going to focus on today is how we developed a comprehensive program to manage pedestrian and cyclists safely and efficiently through um, work zones in a manner that is in keeping with both the spirit and the law that was being discussed by um, the representatives from FHWA. So with that said, um, you know, we have the um, benefit of riches here in that we have a giant construction boom going on. We, you can see the cranes in this photo. The district has about $50 billion worth of projects coming through the development pipeline. And um, unless those developments can find a way to magically create more space, uh, we're stuck with the public space that we have and the sidewalks, roadways that we can use to navigate uh, and, and uh, transit people through those work zones as the work is happening. So this is the way the world used to be, and you can see a lot of the photos that have been shared sort of reflect something like this. So um, con contractors and developers, uh, including people who work even in our industry in the transportation construction industry will always say, oh, the safest thing to do is to close the area and put people to the other side of where our work is happening because that's the, quote, safe thing to do. Well, it clearly isn't, not only because pedestrians um, will follow the path of least resistance, but also because um, it's not uh, necessary. So there are very efficient and very simple ways that we can keep people adjacent to work zones along the path of travel that they have been using or immediately adjacent to the travel path that they've been using that doesn't disrupt traffic and doesn't disrupt construction. It allows it to operate safely and it keeps traffic, traffic moving as well. So we decided to tackle this head on. What we did was we developed pedestrian safety and work zone standards. We adopted them in 2007 and then they became part of a departmental order in 2010. So the standards were adopted um, a little over 12 years ago and then uh, they became a formal departmental order in 2010, but we have been following them for a little bit more than a decade. What matters is the following. It targeted every possible approach to particularly vertical construction and how to manage and route pedestrians safely through those. Um, we focused on four basic options, which is the sidewalk or the roadway, covered or open. And we developed them not as a um, set of standards to be handed down from on high, but they were very specific and deliberately developed with the people who would implement them at the table with us. So not only was DDOT's team there, so our pedestrian um, uh, team, our pedestrian uh, program group was there, our traffic control inspections group was there, our plan review group was there, our ADA accessibility group was there, but also the development community was at the table as well, the contractors, developers themselves, subcontractors who work in the scaffolding industry. Um, and we met iteratively over the course of several months. Um, we would set one policy in one meeting, we'd develop the draft, we'd come back to it at the next meeting, and then once we had set it at that second meeting, it was absolutely done, we wouldn't come back and revisit it. And that was the kind of important elements to developing a really solid policy that would be both um, um, reasonable and one that people could implement effectively, but also that wouldn't immediately be reopened and reopened and reopened so that it could never be fully formed and set. And this will give you an idea of what it did. So there was a lot of verbiage that went into it, but this is really what broke down to specific details what we expected people to do. So during various phases of construction, um, we would require or prefer a covered walkway in the sidewalk or a covered walkway in the roadway, an open walkway in the sidewalk, an open walkway in the roadway, or as, as um, one possibility, a sidewalk closure. And you can see that the only time 
that we would require, that we would prefer a sidewalk closure is when there were immediate hazards from the construction activity itself that are ones that can't be engineered out of the process. So that was just raise and facade demolition. Everything else, sheeting and terrain excavation, concrete or steel frame construction, all of this other work, including skin and facade construction, can be done with pedestrians walking in the area adjacent to where the work is happening. In some cases, though, the preferred method is a covered walkway to protect from falling hazards from above. Um, we want people to know, and this was part of a mind shift change, closing a sidewalk is not the same as shifting a lane of traffic. It is the same as a detour. You're routing people from one sidewalk to a different other sidewalk. It's the same way as, same thing as closing a full roadway and routing vehicles to another roadway. So that was part of an important mind shift that we had to have people go through. And we also wanted um, developers, contractors, our reviewing groups as well, everybody to understand parking is not sacrosanct. Parking should be removed to provide accessibility, uh, accessible paths for pedestrians and eventually also cyclists as we'll talk about later. So it was about shifting minds, getting people to the table, working together cooperatively and making sure that we came up with a reasonable practical guide that worked for everyone. This is what we came, this is what the outcome was. Now I'm a little ashamed about the ramp that you see because it's semi-accessible, but it does need some work and we do have standards that show that. But this is a good effective method by which we now route pedestrians around major construction sites for 18 months, 24 months. Um, it's a convenient route, it's protected from traffic and construction, it's ADA compliant with a ramp with the handrails, um, it's uh, with its proper width, it is a covered route and it has lighting, um, and we also require them to keep the area clean uh, as well as free of graffiti or, or markings on the walls themselves. Um, we even can may find ways to keep sidewalks open during um, uh, excavation, sheeting and shoring, sheeting and shoring phases. Um, not shorting, I just want to point out, it's not sheeting and shorting phases, it's sheeting and shoring phases. I apologize for my uh, typo there. Um, you can even be very close to a, a giant construction site uh, with a deep hole in it and still have pedestrians very safely, relatively immediately adjacent. Um, so as I said, those were a departmental order and uh, there was first a, a standard that we set and then the departmental order. I do want to point out one thing about it. Let me go back for a quick second. One thing that was important about this was that we did establish a phase-in period. So while we established the standards, one of the last points we made with the developers was we couldn't expect them to immediately implement this the next day. They needed a phase in period, but we didn't want that phase in period to be um, as extended as they might want it to be. So we set a standard of four months. So four months from the day that the standards were adopted in 2007, we expected them to be implemented in the field uh, and we got very good, very strong compliance. I'll say that generally speaking in the District of Columbia, broadly speaking and, and very effectively, it is the norm that people experience across the district um, uh, as a matter of course rather than an exception. So we've got a great standard that people now follow on a regular basis. So that was, uh, that was what was happening with pedestrians. But then there was a, a boom and a, and a substantial increase in districts, the district's infrastructure for cyclists across the district. So we implemented our bike share um, programs, you know, that um, dockless bikes and other methods of travel have become very common. Uh, at the same time, the district developed some uh, separated bike lanes as well as uh, installing, you know, ten, uh, you know, 10 plus miles of bike lanes across the city. Um, so what the, what the council did in working with uh, some DDOT offices was it developed what we call the Safe Accommodations Act. What the Safe Accommodations Act did was essentially two things. It took them the standard that we developed in 2007 that then became a director's order in 2010 and formalized it as actually a regulation. So it's referenced in the regulations that were passed as part of the Safe Accommodations Act in 2014. Uh, in addition, it established a relatively similar standard or hierarchy that we were looking at before for cyclists at work zones. The key being that um, they would be treated the same, so blockages of sidewalks and bike lanes are treated the same as a manner as the closure of a lane of motor vehicle traffic, so that they would apply the same standards. They have to be an equally safe route provided to pedestrians and cyclists as that they had before the blockage occurred. 
and those areas have to be maintained free of obstructions, surface hazards, et cetera. Um, what does that really mean? So for pedestrians, it came back to what we talked about. The sidewalk closure with a detour would be a last resort and would only happen in those cases where um, routing on the same side of the street is infeasible or impractical as determined by us. Not as determined by the applicant, but as determined by us. And the closure would be for a limited period of time or safety conditions at the work site, which could include things like sinkholes that accidentally occurred. We had that one at one of our construction sites recently. Um, and so the sidewalk had to be closed, but it was limited in time. So, so as soon as the hazard was addressed, we were able to um, reopen that sidewalk. Okay. So with that said, we then um, pointed out that routing pedestrians to the sidewalk on the opposite side of the street shall only be approved as a last resort. And I want to point that and emphasize that language, which is what we do with our applicants. Closing the pedestrians and the sidewalk to pedestrians and routing them to the other side is a last resort, and it is the burden is on the applicant and the designer to explain why they can't um, use the existing infrastructure on the side, whether it's a curb lane, shifting travel lanes, et cetera, to manage pedestrians on that side of the roadway. Um, and that also pointed out that um, we didn't want to have competition between bicyclist facilities and pedestrian facilities. So if we were moving pedestrians out of the sidewalk onto the curb lane where we often have bicycle facilities, we would also close adjacent motor vehicle lanes and shift bicycle lanes as well. So it would be like pedestrians coming into the bike lane, bike lane going into the travel lane, and the two travel lanes being merged into one. That's a very common occurrence now. Um, we had similar standards related to cyclists, which is maintaining the existing or creating an equivalent bike lane, merging uh, bike lanes and travels is the least preferred alternative other than closing them. So we do make this something that, again, is a last resort. And again, it becomes part of the requirement, duty, and responsibility of the applicant to show why they can't do it. So those are all great standards. Those are all great rules. But again, as you see with the what we do with pedestrians, it's about how they're implemented in the right-of-way. So how they were implemented in the right-of-way were um, done in an iterative fashion, similar to what we did with those pedestrian um, standards. So uh, the rules are good, but a typical traffic control plan makes them practical. So we did the same thing here that we did um, with the pedestrian safety standards. We developed 15 typical work zone guides. We had 10 stakeholder meetings that included intergovernmental, private sector, and cyclist community. So we had everybody at the table working on them. We had more than 40 people provide really clear input to the plans that you're looking at in front of you. The plans that you're looking at in front of you are really detailed, well documented, and they also cover multiple types of infrastructure. So if you look at the one on the left, it's a protected bike lane with a two-way roadway. The one in the middle is a protected bike lane with a one-way roadway, and the one on the right is a contraflow lane. Now these are just a sample of the more than 15 typical work zone guides that we have now developed and are available on our website at d.dc.gov, which I'll share with you later on in the presentation. So again, typical traffic control plans are good, but infield training makes them real. In other words, you can put a plan together, right? So you can have a, a rule or a law, but does the plan reflect that? And then you can have a plan that reflects that, but does it get implemented in the field? So we've held multiple trainings in the field. We've had more than 100, actually now over 150 people trained. We just recently had one. We've had actually now more than 20 different companies attended. Four of our own DDOT offices have attended the trainings. They were held on different roadways with different bike infrastructure. So we did one on a contraflow lane. We did one on a uh, separated lane. And we also did one as though there were an emergency and there was no way to remove parking. So we really went through a very thorough, comprehensive process when we did the infield training. And we're even building another training module that will include testing people on the regulations and standards, testing people on plan review and plan development, as well as a field uh, implementation program. So this is a great example of what the outcome was from what we did. This was a site in the downtown area of the District of Columbia, a very busy site on 15th Street, immediately north of K Street. The building that was being, um, was being raised, there was actually a giant raise activity of four buildings that used to house the Washington Post, which moved to another site and now, hold, now hosts a new building which has uh, Fannie Mae's campus. The, um, and what we did here was, since we were raising buildings, we had to close 
um, the immediately adjacent area to provide for the construction vehicles that would be performing the the rays. What we you can see is we where the double yellow line is. So if you look uh, at this point, here's a double yellow line where we had a two-way separated bike lane. Um, let me go back for a second. It actually is very much like this two-way separated bike lane, though in this case it was a two-way separated bike lane on a two-way travel lane, so southbound and northbound travel. Coming back to the picture, so we did have it close to pedestrians. As we know, some pedestrians will walk in the right way, in, in the roadway when available, so we put notes up, bike lane for bikes only, no pedestrian traffic. But what we ended up doing with the cyclists was we routed them out, we took out a travel lane, and we routed them into a travel lane over here beyond the sign. We set up the construction fencing here, and we did it in a tapered fashion so, so cyclists could keep their relative speed as they came through. Motorists continued on in the remaining travel lanes over here. Pedestrians were supposed to go to the other side of the roadway. That wasn't as common as we would have liked it to have been. So we did have a little bit of conflict between pedestrians and cyclists. This is, however, how it looked, which was fantastic, once we actually had them under construction. So once they were doing their construction activity, we had, were able to relocate the two-way cycle track. You can see that they, even on this temporary basis, we had them put in a full set of pylons. We had Jersey um, water-filled barriers installed. We had full markings installed. Uh, we put in new markings over here and eradicated at the markings for a travel lane that had been here. We put pedestrians in this lane, gave them full ample room because of the phase of construction they were in that they didn't need a overhead protection, which also is incorporated based on the distance that they are from the construction activity. So this was a really, uh, a really big win for us and a very early example of uh, um, a great um, uh, implementation of our uh, pedestrian safety and work zone standards, but it didn't come easily and I'll tell you why because as I said, this was at 15th and L Street, northwest of Washington, D.C. So the 15th Street side was really the ideal situation. Um, oh, by the way, I didn't, I didn't notice this part for you, but you can see that we even did the um, markings to route pedest uh, the cyclists back over to where, over here, they would be picking up the cycle track as it continued. Going from there... Uh, when you, we had the other side, which was the uh, L Street side, and with um, apologies to Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, while you can't always get what you want, sometimes you can get what you need. So here were the conditions on the L Street side. The property that was being developed was over here on the right-hand side. And here's what L Street looked like at, before construction started. You had one, two, three full travel lanes. You had, it's all one way, fortunately. You had a one-way cycle track, even though the pedestrian might be going in a slightly different than legal direction. And we had a turn lane here uh, as you approached. So it really was like you had three and a half travel lanes and a bike lane. So we literally measured the roadway to the inch to find every option that we could because the work zone, as you can see, had to come out fairly substantially. If I recall correctly, it came out essentially to about this full travel lane which meant that we were taking three and a half travel lanes, three travel lanes in the left turn lane and a bike lane and condensing them into two lanes. So how did we do that? We couldn't continue the fully protected one-way cycle track, so we took the cycle track and, and turned it into a shared lane. This lane was a full 13 feet from the uh, white line to the exterior edge of the Jersey barrier on this side. So that we gave them a full space, and then I believe this lane was, um, uh, I think it was 11 feet. I'd have to go back and check my records. It might have been 10 feet. It would have been 11 if it was a bus lane. So we had to take those three full lanes, one cycle lane, return them to one through lane and one shared lane. We did change signal timing. So at the intersection at the far end, if you can see my cursor over where the conditions before construction, here at 16th Street, we changed the signal timing and installed signs so that the cyclists could enter into the shared lane, into this shared lane back over at the intersection in advance of motorists. So they, so cyclists at the intersection were able to get in ahead of the motorists. We also, at that end, I didn't note this for you, but we, at this end, we did reduce the travel lanes from three to two so that they were already in two lanes as they came across so that they weren't trying to merge at this end as well. We did the merge in advance. 
We put the cyclists out in front based on signal timing and uh, signage. And then not only did we do that, we eliminated this left turn. So we took out this left turn in its entirety so that we wouldn't have people who would be trying to turn left out of this shared lane. We had some, in, um, some challenges with that, but we got our Metropolitan Police Department out there. They were great partners with us, and they started issuing tickets. And once they started issuing tickets, people stopped doing it. So it's really a great win-win as best we could do with what we had to work with. Um, in, the, in the end, the, what we do, we do allow a temporary stoppage of cyclists or pedestrians if necessary, typically to accommodate bringing vehicles onto a site or having vehicles come out of a site. We only allow those to happen during off-peak hours, 9.30 to 3.30. A flagger has to be posted at each end of the closure, so the entire duration of the intermittent closure is in place so that the pedestrians or cyclists um, are, are notified in advance of the closure, and we only allow it for the time that the vehicle is coming in and out. Um, and so that's, that's really the presentation I have. I really appreciate your time. I did want to note that several of our standards are available online. So the pedestrian safety and work zone standards that I talked about are available via the link that I know is being shared um, by UNC. We really appreciate UNC inviting us to participate in this. Um, we also have those work zone typicals, so not just the three you saw, but all the other ones that we uh, implemented, which also include, by the way, I didn't note this for you, um, those also include um, ADA accessible ramps and how those are supposed to be installed at work zones. So no more of that wooden ramp that you saw, but really fully formed ramps. And the way the ramps are now oriented, the ramps are oriented in line with the travel lane, so that rather than a pedestrian um, having to come down the, from the curb to the uh, roadway, they actually enter onto a platform at curb and sidewalk level, and then can turn on a five by five platform and uh, then proceed down a ramp to bring them to uh, the roadway level, and then the same thing at the receiving side. Now, so we have those work zone typicals, but we also have our safe accommodations for pedestrians and cyclists regulation available online, uh, and my contact information is there. Uh, really appreciated everybody's time and, uh, and, and the partnership with UNC um, and the Federal Highway Administration and others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew, and to the rest of our panelists as well. We've got some time now. Uh, for a Q and A, and we we have a lot of questions that came in. I'll try to do my best to get to as many as we as we can before our time is up. Um, we do have contact information I'm posting up here in case you want to reach out individually to any of us. We're happy to uh, answer those questions. But the first one uh, that that I wanted to get to is um, I don't know who wants to be the first one to respond to this, but um, all of this, all these standards, and there's a lot of good guidance. It's all um, you know, a lot of good models out there. But ultimately, I think uh, eight people on the line are interested in how we go about encouraging buy-in from private sector and contractors to really ensure that the standards and the guidelines that we're setting out are, are actually used and adopted and um, ultimately enforced. We can get to enforcement in a second, but I wanted to ask you all about strategies to get that buy-in from others involved in this, the developers themselves, the private sector, um, how to kind of arrive at this shared vision for, for maintaining access and and connectivity through work zones. I don't know if anyone has any tips that they would share about kind of establishing that buy-in among all the participating parties. I'll chime in uh, quickly and then allow Matthew since he uh, developed the uh, guidance document. But something that everybody, especially in the transportation community, that they should be looking into, into building partnerships and maintaining that credibility from the pedestrians, just make sure that when you install signs, uh, if they are not, if the work zone is not occurring, cover them. If you are uh, working on a detour and you have a pathway, make sure, like Melissa was saying, you're taking them back to a sidewalk and not uh, to a different building and things like that. So again, it's building partnerships and credibility. Make sure that what you're trying to do is actually happening and that you're getting feedback. Some DOTs have uh, surveys on where the customers can go back and say, you know what, that construction project is not working for me. I walk every morning and it, the sidewalk is covered or the detour is not working. So again, it's working and with the credibility of a good work zone safety in mind. 
But with that, I, I think Matthew can elaborate on that and, and maybe others. Uh, yeah, I, I can speak to our experience here. Um, as I noted in, in some of the slides, uh, they, the key is having them at the table. They are not the deciders, but they have to have a voice. And you know, our standards are going to be standards that are specific to the district, and every jurisdiction will be different, and, and they'll develop the standards that are relative to and reflective of how their city is, you know, is building and growing and developing. Um, but those developers, as I often say to them, I say, you know, one of the things we have to remember is you're building the city of tomorrow. And so we, have to, we, we need to be reflective of that in how we treat the relationship. By reaching out to the industry association, so you know, DC Building Industry Association, the Associated Builders and Contractors, the National Utility Contractors Association, the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, and a host of other acronyms that I could list, having them at the table, going over the plans with them in advance, getting their feedback and getting their buy-in went a very long way to getting them to not only adapt, uh, adopt, but adopt and also self-police self and self-enforce. A, a, a simple aside was that while we were in the middle of developing this pedestrian safety standard, one of the um, advocates at the table was you know, pounding the table saying, this is never going to work. You all don't know what you're doing. This is terrible. Oh, my God, the city's going to fall apart. Nobody's going to build in the District of Columbia. So the meeting ended, and the senior person from the group that we were working with from the D.C. Building Industry Association came, pulled, aside, pulled me aside and said, that person's an idiot. The city is absolutely going to continue to build, and you're doing exactly the right thing. I will take care of this internally. So by having that partnership with them, we were able to get their larger group buy-in so they even silence each other. Plus, if they don't adapt, they're going to, it's going to cost them more in the end, and the people who are compliant at the beginning are going to be more uh, are going to have a, a, a more seamless process and it's going to reduce their costs. A second thing that we've done related to traffic control is we've developed what we call a preliminary design review meeting. So when a developer will be going through a building process, they can come to our office with just very rough plans and they might not even have brought a contractor on board, but we can walk through the area with them and we can talk with them about as they're going through their construction what we would expect them to be able to do to re realign, redesign, and implement a traffic control plan that works for them. So it's about communicating with them, being direct with them, but also being uh, receptive to what they have to say and what they think can work for their industry, and then also keeping those touch points going, including for individual projects. Yeah, you know, and, and this is Patrick. I mean, I, I concur with what both Matthew and, and, and Martha, I think they said it very well. The, what I'm seeing as I go out and, and do a lot of, of training throughout the United States, I think it's key that you get all the all the players involved trained, make sure that they have the education that they need uh, for, you know, for going out and understanding work zones and, and construction and, and the ADA. But have those ongoing meetings, like Matthew said, have the ongoing meetings, get input, get feedback, um, talk about and discuss problems or issues that you're having. Maybe it's unique and maybe there could be a, a way of dealing with these various issues, but I think that, that they're both right in, in the sense that you need the partnership. You have to get buy-in from, from folks or else it's not going to be implemented. Well, those are, those are all excellent points. And I, the, the, sort of the continuation of that, um, this, this whole topic, um, and it's the one that we got the most questions about, is this idea of enforcement of what you said in, as your policy. And I think I'm seeing in some of the questions and comments agencies feeling like we may have the capacity to adopt these standards and these guidelines, but we may not feel that we have the capacity to really enforce this and, and really hold, um, hold developers accountable and those doing the construction and, and requiring to set up the alternate zones or the alternate um, routes, uh, hold them accountable for following these standards. And so I wanted to ask you all about your tips or thoughts about the proper way to go about enforcement. And, and do, you, do you feel that agencies actually do have the capacity to, to enforce these standards? Anyone care to weigh in on enforcement? Uh, I, I'm probably the only one on the line with a badge. Um, well, I, I might be the only person on the line with a badge. Um, yeah, so uh, 
you know, all the all the training, all the discussion, all the communication can only go so far. Um, we have a zero tolerance policy related to a uh, lack of safe accommodations. What we have done in our office is we've developed what we call a rapid response strike force. So, uh, and, and coincidentally, we worked with the Washington Area Bicyclists Association to establish an online platform that their members can use to notify us directly of issues that they found in the field related to safe accommodations. Uh, not only that, we also have Twitter accounts and 311 and ask the directors. So we get a lot of feedback from people. What our rapid response strike force does is um, we acknowledge receipt of the complaint. We set a one hour time limit by which our team will be on site and document that we're on site. So they'll report back we're on site. Um, they have, uh, they take whatever steps are necessary to address the issue at the time. They report back on their findings. And we've issued shut, uh, I'll just put it this way. Um, I have personally been on a site and issued a stop work order to the District Department of Transportation. So I've issued a stop work order to our own office. Um, and, and, and it's because safety cannot be compromised. So it does require a commitment. And I would say that it requires a commitment from the senior leadership level. When, when we were discussing this with the director of the Department of Transportation, we explained that's the level of enforcement activity we would go to. And he said, that's what you should do. We, we are no special. We are no different than anybody else. Um, and then that's why we've also gone through trainings and iterative discussions with our own internal groups to make sure they know this, the rules and standards to follow. And that's why many of them have gone through our training. So you do. You want to avoid the need for enforcement, but if you do have to enforce, I cannot stress more strongly that it's uniform, consistent, and um, to the greatest extent possible. So rather than rather than you know giving a person a written warning and telling them to clean up an unsafe condition, you enforce the unsafe condition at the time and you shut them down until they can show that they can make it safe. You know, and and, and I think Matthew said it well. This is Patrick again, and I would say that. Sometimes you just involve the actual authorities. You say this is going to be a change condition. This went from a a a, a crossing to and now it's and not a place where, where where pedestrians can cross. You alert the authorities and have them do the enforcement because as a, a local public agency or a state agency, you're not out there enforcing the law when people are breaking the law. So just make sure you actually get the law enforcement involved. They know what's going on so that they can actually enforce. The, the law. Great, thank you. Thanks everybody for that. Um, one one more question, uh, Martha. I actually, wanted, or I'm sorry, Melissa. I wanted to see if you could uh, weigh in on this one. You, uh, this is more just sort of the nitty gritty and detail. The you mentioned some of the surfaces that are often used in in work zones that that may be less than ideal. This plywood uh, and the sheet metal, the kind of slippery surfaces. And, and we had a few people following up and asking, do we have good recommendations for surfaces that actually do work well? And um, or maybe some sources they can go to to find some detail on. I don't know if you have any recommendations for where people should look uh, for the, the best stuff to use. So you can you can look at different state DOTs that have found, you know, someone, if your local agency look to your own state DOT or some in the surrounding area that may have same environmental conditions. And a lot of people have come up with good ideas like putting um, a rubberized coating over plywood that provides the slip resistance that's needed. Um, you can always put down, you know, a, a thin layer of asphalt or, you know, a really, a really thin layer of short-term concrete. And what you save in maintaining uh, a temporary route, you might make up for in the, you know, with the cost of an asphalt or concrete temporary surface. So I think it was the um, Texas link that Martha provided that I went through and I saw all kinds of really good ideas and even discussions on different types of, of plywood that worked in different environments. So you might look back to Martha's slides uh, when they come out and check some of those resources. Excellent. Those are, those are yeah, really good I was going to say, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So I, I was going to no. say that the ADSA guide uh, does have a lot of good recommendations. And again, I, I I encourage everyone to visit the Work Zone Safety Information Clearinghouse, Accommodating Pedestrians, 
web page because you're going to find a lot of information there. I appreciate that, and, I, and Melissa, I appreciate your comment about the uh, current, the weather conditions and climate and geography. We, uh, we didn't even really touch on a lot of the snow issues and, and things that can happen um, weather-wise that, that might impact the materials you're putting on the ground. Things may not look the same after a couple of days as they did when you first put things down. So I, I, I think that that's a really um, interesting comment um, to an encouragement to people to, to follow up and, and do walk through and check on what you've done and, and see how it works. So. Um, I, I'm sad to say that that's all the time we have for our discussion period today. I do hope you'll follow up with us. Uh, we have our contact information here. We'd be interested to follow up with you and your questions and maybe provide some additional detail. All the resources that the panelists put in their slides that we've now posted on our website are available to you. So I encourage you to read through some of that information and maybe take a look at some of those links. Um, I want to remind you all that you'll be receiving an email uh, in just about an hour that'll have a link to our archive page where we'll be posting the uh, video recording when it's available. The slides are already there. Um, we'll also be including in that email the link to the webinar certificate, so you can generate that and use it for reporting your continuing education hours. I wanted to let you also know that a brief survey is going to appear when you end uh, when you close out of the webinar. I'd really appreciate if you could take some time to share your feedback with us and offer your thoughts on maybe future topics we could explore with our webinar series. Uh, finally, I just want to say a, a thank you to Martha Kapitanov, uh, Mar uh, Patrick Gomez, Melissa Anderson, Matthew Marcu for delivering uh, excellent presentations today. And thanks to all of you uh, for attending today's webinar. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day, and we will see you next time. Thank you.